Um, and she, so she says again that what went on with her own children was part of the dynamics and, and the flow of this era. And it's a very, very interesting, you know, psychologically it's extremely interesting maneuver and device that she does there. In fact, a third of her kids converted three. She had set, she writes about four. She actually had seven, which again, if you memoirs of a grandmother, is pretty strange behavior. So one of my things is like, who are the rest of them, and why are they not in, and why are the ones who are in in, and why are the ones who are out out, or whatever. Um, so seven kids, three of whom converted. This is, you know, something major is going on in this family. Um, and then she. She writes about the era of pogroms and the fear of it, so we get that. Uh, really a very evocative description of it. it doesn't happen, but they don't know that until the wave passes, the terror of it, and hiding the knives in the house because she has Christian servants and she doesn't know where it's going to come from. Very, very uh, dramatic depiction. And then volume two ends with this extraordinary description of Hanan's death. You would think she hated him. She actually clearly loved him uh, deeply, and she writes this whole chapter, distraught chapter, description of, of his death, and it ends. It ends. It ends with her saying he was put into the ground, he was buried, and the Maggid of Minsk, the Stadt, the Stadt Maggid of, of Minsk, the preacher of Minsk, comes and says over his grave that he was, you know, we all know he kind of, <laughs> however they put it, um, it wasn't, you know, I, I don't quite remember the exact wording, but you know, he deviated a little bit, shall we say. But he was a good Jew. Um, the two of them opened schools. They did a lot of charity. They opened schools for artisans, he for boys, she for girls, which she wrote, that's, you know, so he's a good Jew, which also stood out to me. Like the definition of good Jew has clearly undergone radical change in this period. And that's how she ends. Um, <coughs> So let me give you a little bit of a, a taste of what she sounds like in some of these uh, in some of these chapters. Um, and I'll, I'll, there's, there's great stuff all over the place. One of the things also that she does in um, in volume one that I didn't mention, and she she gives us an extremely rich depiction of Jewish women's ritual and their spiritual lives, things that we often don't hear anything about, don't know anything about. And she gives us very, very detailed descriptions of it, um, which is extremely valuable stuff. Um, she also writes, you know, she's got a, a keen sense of wit and humor and anecdote, and she gives us wonderful stuff about that, which I'll skip for now. Um, but now let me give you where she gets to, yeah, where she gets to talking about the, the gender difference. said two things. Two things I can say with certainty. I and my door, my generation, will certainly live and die as Jews. Our Einiklech, our grandchildren, will certainly not live and die as Jews. What our children will be, only that I can't guess. So this is again the mother, right, who's so, so deeply suspicious of modernity, because Jews will not be able to withstand it. They won't survive it. The two first prophetical assertions have been partially fulfilled. The third is also being fulfilled because our generation is a kind of hybrid. Carried along by the irresistible pull of the new West European culture, we strove even in old age to acquire knowledge in diverse fields of learning and in foreign languages. However, while other peoples and nations took of the modern and alien currents only that which accorded with their ways, thus preserving their individuality and peculiarity, a curse burdened the Jewish people that would, it would adopt unto itself the foreign and the new only, while renouncing the old, its most characteristic and holy aspects. How chaotically did modern ideas whirl in the minds of Russian Jewish men? Abruptly and irresistibly, the spirit of the 60s and 70s forced its way into Jewish life and destroyed its previous character. Recklessly, the old was renounced. 
The old family patterns disappeared without new ones to replace them. For most of the Jewish women of that time, religion and tradition had permeated their innermost nature so completely that they experienced violation of them <coughs> almost with physical pain. For this reason, they had to resist, to wage a difficult battle in their, in in their most intimate domestic circles. In this transitional era, the right of, the child, of child rearing was entrusted to the mother, the natural teacher, teacher of her children, only for that period when the child required nothing but difficult sacrifice and arduous duties. But as soon as the time for moral education arrived, the, the mother was brutally shoved aside, and her authority over and care of her children ended. The woman, who still clung to tradition with every fiber of her being, wanted to impart it to her children, too. The morals of Judaism, the traditions of its faith, the solemnity of the Sabbath and festivals, this is what I was describing before, her list. The Hebrew, the traditions, the teachings of the Bible, this book of all books. She wanted to transmit this whole treasure to her children in beautiful and exalted forms, together with the fruits of enlightenment, together with the new that West European culture had produced. <clears throat> but to all pleas and protests, and they always, they, the women, always receive the same answer from their husbands. The children need no religion. The young Jewish men of that time knew nothing of moderation and wanted to know nothing of it. In their inexperience, they wanted to make the dangerous leap instantly from the lowest rung of culture directly to the highest. Many demanded of their wives not just assent, but submission. They demanded of them of abolition of all that was holy but yesterday preaching in society all the modern ideas like freedom, equality, and brotherhood, these young men were at home the greatest despots to their wives, ruthlessly demanding the fulfillment of their wishes. There were bitter conflicts within the family life that until now had flowed in so patriarchal and contemplative a way, which is patriarchal, she means calm, and not what we mean by it. Many, many women did not wish to give in. They let their husbands have full freedom outside the house asking, however, that in their own homes the old, beloved customs be respected. That this double life was not tenable in the long run is obvious. The spirit of the age triumphed in this contest, and the weaker yielded with bleeding hearts. That is what happened to others and to me, as I will relate in coming chapters. So here she's, I'll read you a bit of a description of, uh, from her description of Kovno. If you know anything about the, the Israel Salanter, the Muslim movement, this is where it originated. So it's a very important, originally a Jewish town for traditionalism, but um, there was already a, a modernizing Jewish group in Kovna. In Kovna, the force of tradition had gradually slackened. When we came to Kovna, the Enlightenment was in full swing, and the new ideas found their enthusiastic advocates. Defection prevailed in the most progressive Jewish houses, especially in wealthy commercial families whose fathers and sons had business connections with Germany and often crossed the border, that the only thing retained was the kosher kitchen. The men no longer kept the Sabbath holy. It did not interrupt the zeal for business. If, as Heine put it, the Jew previously had been a dog the whole week, but on the Sabbath was transformed into a prince, and at the Seder table into a sovereign, the men of the second generation lived like dogs the whole year, without <laughs> respite or repose, perpetually absorbed in work and worries. Their spirits no longer soared aloft to heavenly spheres, and their bodies no longer gathered up in the powerful tranquility of the Sabbath, the strength lost in the week's work. It was a peculiarly mixed up, restless atmosphere on the Sabbath. The woman, whose whole disposition clung to tenaciously to the ancient ways, still used to kindle the Sabbath lights on Friday evening and say the prayer. But her enlightened Lord husband kindled a cigarette with them. <laughs> and her otherwise so peaceable countenance vanished into a pained smile. With the same cordiality which, with which the master of the house once welcomed the Sabbath angel, he now welcomed his friends who claimed to, came to play cards. To be sure, the kiddish cup stood filled, stood wine-filled on the table, but no one sipped of it. It had become a symbol. Stuffed pepperfish, however. The apostasy did not go so far to banish even this from the Friday evening table. <laughs> 